What can we learn from the dog whisper? César Milán. Now I disagree with how he explains behavior, his choices of training techniques, and the way that he relates to animals. So what else is there? There's the importance of body language. I think he's onto something with regards to body language. So while I disagree with his explanation and how he actually goes about using body language, I think he's discovered a tool that many of us are unaware of, a tool that's been unused by many uh, pet owners and animal professionals. So let's look at some of the documented effects of power posing. The high power poses are expansive, taking up space, legs apart. There's no slouching, the arms are wide, assertive, confident. Think Wonder Woman. Do this for two minutes. The low power poses, the legs crossed, arms crossed, slouching, making yourself small, Insecure, think Clark Kent. The Christopher Reeve interpretation. Again, two minutes. So, firstly, after two minutes of posing, the high power people, Wonder Woman, increase their testosterone, which is a hormone related to aggression. And not just a trifle, but about 20%. They also decrease their cortisol levels by one quarter. And cortisol is a stress hormone. And it's vice versa in the low power people, the Clark Kents. The Clarks, they get a reduction of testosterone and a cortisol spike. In other words, a stress response after two minutes of doing nothing other than assuming a specific body position. Now the high power people are more prone to gamble too, more risk taking. So Wonder Woman gambles, but she's not stressed. Her cortisol is low, testosterone high. So she's confident and at ease, calm, assertive. Clark Kent is less likely to gamble, but he's stressed and insecure. He's not in a good place to make decisions, stress reactive and shut down. I won't call the people or dogs doing low power poses calm, submissive, for reasons that I explain in the blog post that goes with this video. So there's a measurable change in chemistry and behavior after two minutes in a specific body position, power posing. And the findings don't end here. In fact, here is where it gets interesting. Here is where you should lean forward and filter this information from a dog perspective. After doing either high or low power poses for a few minutes, researchers sent their volunteers into a very stressful job interview where they had to spend five minutes talking about why they should get their dream job in front of two stone-faced evaluators and a camera. And then some researchers would watch these films and say, oh, we want to hire these people. And uh, no, we don't want to hire those people. And this was without knowing whether the person had been doing high power posing or low power posing. They would reject the low power posing and select the high power posing people. And this was, and it wasn't the, the, the content of the speech that decided, it was about the presence, the confidence. So there was a change in how these people were visually perceived. So how about a dog? What if you had been power posing before interacting with the animal? People spot the difference. How about dogs? A dog would have three different types of input from a human who's been doing power posing before interacting with the dog. The visual input, the stance, how a person moves, whether they seek eye contact, are they staring or just looking? the input of choices, the decisions of the person, the degree of risk-taking, the tone of voice, the choice of training techniques and procedures. And that brings in the whole dimension of reward and punishment and classical conditioning too, of course. But let's put all that aside. 
I don't want to lose myself in discussing the choice of training techniques. Just know that those choices are likely to be affected by power posing. And then there's the olfactory input, smells. Remember, two minutes of high power posing leads to a 20% increase in testosterone. Can dogs smell that? Duh! People can smell testosterone. Women prefer the smell of manly guys, <laughs> and it's the testosterone that they detect. So of course dogs can smell testosterone. Their, their sense of smell is like a gazillion times better than ours. So dogs can smell testosterone, a hormone associated with aggressive behavior, and they can also smell cortisol, a hormone that is stress-related. So will dogs change their behavior as a result of all this different type of input that they're getting? Cesar Milan spends a lot of time in high power poses, changing his body chemistry and assertiveness. And he actually makes a point of doing it in front of, or facing or challenging the dogs. Check out the blog post that goes with this video for a discussion on what that might lead to. So Milan uses challenging high power posing to change the body language of dogs. So body language changes. How about chemistry? I don't know. How about other behavior and decisions of the dog? Well, yeah, at least short term. So this has some interesting implications. And as far as I know, it hasn't been studied scientifically. We know that behavior changes due to a few different and to some extent overlapping mechanisms. And here are some of the most important when it comes to behavior management operant learning, punishments and rewards or reinforcers, classical conditioning, learning to predict the order of events, emotional states. Now, emotions and moods influence behavior, and sometimes we mistake mood changes for learning. How does power posing affect dogs' behavior? How much explanatory power should we give to this mechanism? Are the dogs on Cesar Milan's TV shows changing their behavior because of the top three mechanisms or the fourth or a combination? I don't know. As far as I know, this hasn't been studied experimentally. So what can we learn from Cesar Milan? Now, I disagree with almost everything he's doing, but that's not the topic of this video. So what I think I can, we can learn from him is that body language is important. And I'm not saying we should copy what he's doing with regards to body language. Now, I'm not saying that I think you should use high power posing as a way to directly challenge your dog in a staring contest until he yields and assumes the, the doggy version of the low power pose. That's not the learning outcome I want you to walk away with from this video. Such an animal might be stressed and not in a good place to learn. Use that to your advantage without putting the animal at a disadvantage. Win-win makes everybody happier. We don't have to put animals in their place to get behavior change. So rather than using your, your body language as a way to dominate, use it to convey a sense of security. Instead of using high power posing to challenge animals to assume the canine version of the low power posing, do a high power pose before interacting with your dog, much like the volunteers in that study did before the job interview. So if dogs can pick up on the stress hormone cortisol, and that in turn makes them anxious, that's reason enough to think about how you carry yourself before interacting with your dog and perhaps before interacting with other animals too. I'm Carolina Westland. Now read the blog post that goes with this video to get the full story and share it with friends if you think they'll find it interesting. Sign up to get my blog updates all about animal behavior management and I'll also keep you posted about future free webinars and online courses. Until next time, take care.